Okay, this week I'm joined by uh, Robert Zalek. Um, Robert Zalek served as the uh, Deputy Secretary, Under Secretary, and Counselor um, at the State Department. Uh, he's been an ambassador and U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, he was Deputy Chief of Staff in the White House, and he's the former President of the World Bank. Uh, today we're going to be discussing his new book, um, America in the World. Uh, a history of U.S. diplomacy and foreign policy, which is here. Um, so you've served in in, in public life, um, well, throughout most of your life. Uh, why did you write this book? Have you always been interested in uh, U.S. foreign policy? Well, Ryan, it's it's good to be with you. Um, and when when I was in government, um, I often drew on history when I was thinking about problems, and so. Uh, during the past four years of the Trump administration, where I didn't expect to be involved with policy, uh, it gave me some time uh, to research and write some, a book that I hope would encourage others, uh, particularly those uh, in, in your generation, to think about how to use history and policy. Um, some people uh, listening to the program may be aware that Henry Kissinger wrote a book in the 90s titled Diplomacy, and he used history to talk about foreign policy but it was very much written from a European real politic perspective. So I wanted to do something that focused on the American experience and some of the ideas uh, from, from US history. And the approach I took to make it more readable for people was to focus on stories. So I focus on uh, each chapter focuses on a person or a small group of people and a particular episode. And I try to use that because I wanted to focus on the practical nature of problem solving in, in government. As you probably know better than I do, at least in the United States today, many foreign policy courses are taught using international relations theory. And while those theories are interesting and fun to play with, they struck me as being somewhat detached from the nature of the work um, that, that I was involved in. So in a way, the book is a series of, of case studies uh, where I try to set out the context, uh, explain what happened, and then add my assessment. And as for your question about the background, I always enjoyed diplomatic history uh, when I was in, in university. Um, as you may know, the field is somewhat faded in the United States, at least over past years, in part because scholars have brought in some of the underappreciated actors and perspectives. And I think that's enriched the field, but I also feel we lost something. So Fred Lagerbaugh, who's a great historian at Harvard, just wrote the first volume biography on John F. Kennedy wrote a piece where he said, why have we stopped teaching political history? And so I wanted to try to give a little nudge in that direction. And I think the last point you may be abused by was that um, in many of my government positions, I would have assistants or a staff, and I had no idea about how much history they had learned. So I suppose I used to torture them with questions to have some feel. And insofar as they had studied history, it tended to be from World War II on. And in the case of the US, as I hope readers of the book will discover, the first 150 years have some fascinating people and events. Indeed. Uh, so let's explore some of those. Um, the, the title of the book is America in the World. Um, so what is the year or the decade even when we can safely say that the United States enters the global order? When does it become a major player on the international stage? Is it at the end of the 19th century or is it when it enters um, the First World War in, in April of 1917. Well, I suppose Europeans might have a slightly different perspective on this. Um, and my own sense is it evolves. So even as early as the US Civil War, so that's 1861 to 1865, you can see the economic influence of the United States on Britain and Europe. Uh, cotton, wheat, um, this was a huge aspect that actually uh, led to some risk of Britain wanting to intervene in the Civil War to reopen cotton markets. Um, by the late 19th century, American industrial power uh, really is, is a match for Britain and Germany. But interestingly enough, um, the first global interaction really occurs around 1899 with a man named John Hay and the open door notes uh, related to China. And this is intriguing because while the United States wanted to stay out of European security politics, it encountered the European powers in East Asia. 
because this was right after the, uh, the scramble to divide up Africa. There was an anxiety that China was going to be carved up by European powers plus Russia and Japan. And so this was an early intervention by the United States designed to preserve China's territorial integrity and, and also to keep it as an open market. So the United States was not really willing to uh, invest sort of security power into the region, but it was kind of the early phase. And then a period that followed right after that, that again, most Europeans may not, not have uh, studied, was the role that Teddy Roosevelt played in mediating the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05, uh, where again, you had European powers uh, on the scene. And the first Moroccan crisis of 1905-06, where he tried to do that quite quietly so as to avoid congressional uh, anxieties about the United States getting involved in security politics. But it's an interesting case because that crisis in Morocco was one of the future that, or, or of a set that was on the edge of Europe, which might have not seemed important in the bigger picture, but that could have triggered great power war. And if you think about 1914, within a decade, that's exactly what happens on another fringe of Europe uh, in the Balkans. And then in, uh, in World War I, 1914-17, the war goes on without the United States. Um, the United States plays a major economic role, but Woodrow Wilson tries to steer a course of neutrality. That fits the traditional American pattern through the 19th century. Um, but it breaks down with U-boats. The traditional neutrality won't work. The, the, the chapter focuses on how he, in a sense, tries to redefine the concept of neutrality into what becomes a form of collective security. And that leads to his thinking for the League of Nations. And then from that point, you're on to kind of the breakdown in the 20s and the 30s and uh, the re-involvement in European security in World War II, and then the 70-year-old alliance system we have to today. So it, it's the, the nature of the book, in a way, is to try to explain that um, people adapt in practical ways to the problems of their era. And I, because because frankly, that I think fits what, if you think about issues on the agenda today, that's how most policymakers will look at it. So you mentioned the John Hay's open door policy there. Um, one of the things that's quite obvious from the book is that uh, US preoccupation with China is nothing new, really. Um, it goes back to 1899, which is um, someone who's not familiar with um, U.S. foreign policy, that was a, a bit of a surprise for me. And you also go into the um, the Nixon and Kissinger relationship with China in in the seventies. Um, wh where are the uh, what are the relationship? Um, what is the relationship between the U.S. and China like today? Is it is it at a low point? Do you think? Do you think they're in a, involved in a new Cold War? Well, you know, to to pick up on your point about uh, the history of relations with China. Um, there's kind of really three themes that you see over the years. Um, the first is China as a great economic opportunity offering a, offer often a star just glittering over the horizon. So you, you mentioned um, the turn of the 20th century. In fact, at, at the turn of the 19th century, you have uh, the Empress to China, the ship goes and brings ginseng from Appalachia and has great profits. So the, uh, the United States kind of followed uh, Britain in terms of the economic openings of China. I have a book in my basement from 1937 titled 400 Million Customers. And it was the idea of how China was gonna be this great economic market, uh, which uh, obviously took a few twists and turns. So one is the economic opportunity. The second, quite interestingly, is China as a, as a potential power on the regional and global stage. So we touched on this in the idea of preserving Chinese territorial integrity in 1900. In 1921, with the Washington Naval Conference, there was another effort because Japan was the power in the region. It was after World War I. The Republic of China was just starting to uh, strengthen its hold over the country, and the United States was trying to support uh, its, its uh, sort of its rise. Um, for those who study World War II, you'll see that um, Franklin Roosevelt, unlike Winston Churchill, was quite devoted to China because he figured it would be one of the major players in the post-war system. Um, and then, as you properly mentioned, there's, there's Nixon and Kissinger. Um, but there's a third theme that, 
it, that is also uh, sometimes underappreciated, which is the American experience with China was driven just as much by missionaries. This is important in Britain too. There is a big missionary uh, contingent. And uh, what you see is a desire over 150 years to convert the Chinese, whether to become uh, Christians, whether to become little capitalists, whether to become small R Republicans. Uh, and when China reacts hostily to that, you get almost a pendulum swing back. You saw this in the Boxer Rebellion. Um, you saw this um, in 1949. You saw it in 1989. And you're seeing a version of it today. So I guess from a historical perspective, I think one of the challenges for the United States with China is accepting it for what it is, not for what we might wish it to be. Um, you asked about historic lows. I think there have been uh, more fraught periods. Uh, in 1949, after uh, Mao took over, and we then had the Korean War from 1950 to 53, that was a pretty hostile period. And in a sense, the United States didn't even recognize China as a, as a government until the, the late 70s. Um, and as for the Cold War analogy, that's tossed around here. Uh, my own view is it's, it's too backward looking, um, although I think one can draw some insights uh, from the alliance leadership role the United States played during the Cold War. In my view, uh, China is an authoritarian power. Uh, it wants to dominate the Western Pacific for sure. It probably wants to have strong influence globally. I wouldn't suggest it necessarily wants the domination that the Soviet Union did. It really doesn't seek to spread communist ideology, although communist ideology is important at home, but it certainly is an authoritarian system. I think the idea that you could contain China like the United States and the West contained uh, Soviet Union is, is folly. And we clearly have a lot of uh, common interests if you think about issues like climate and biological security. I think under Xi Jinping, China has turned more uh, nationalist uh, it feels the historical grievances. So this is where the study of history is important to understand how the Chinese view the world. Um, I think that from the United States perspective, the starting point is to focus on our own strengths at home. And I believe it's a mistake to imitate the Chinese uh, effort to close off societies. China will always be able to close off more than the United States can. Um, and uh, I think what would be important will be for the US to work with its allies and partners to point out a contradiction in Chinese policy, which is on the one hand, for domestic reasons, Xi Jinping has to maintain economic growth for legitimacy, but he also is acting in a more expansionist way in foreign policy. And I think it will be important for the US and allies in the world to demonstrate that foreign policy expansionism or bullying will be not uh, work well with their idea of, of economic growth. Um, and what that would mean, for example, is where the Trump administration alienated a lot of allies, I actually think you'll watch the Biden administration try to repair some of those relations. And not only in the Asia Pacific, but also I think this will be an important question for Great Britain and, and the European Union, because where the US was strong in the Cold War was developing an alliance system that allowed pluralism, cooperation, opportunity for others to pursue their own interests, while also prodding to keep the focus on the dangers of, of the Soviet Union. So I think this will be one of the big challenges for the coming decades. So you've, uh, you've rejected the, the label of the Cold War, but the people who tend to use it um, focus on it's been, it's been a trade war, but also technology, which is a, a theme of the book. Um, which chapter 12 is, is dedicated to. Um, so the US and China are currently engaged in a, in a tech war essentially over semiconductors, artificial intelligence, 5G capabilities and so on. Uh, even vaccine development now, I suppose. Um, do you think the US is still on top um, due to its, its um, Silicon Valley um, influence across the world and um, its research and development strengths? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that chapter, just to, to pause for a minute on it. I, I focus on a man named Van Everbush. And Van Everbush would probably not appear in most uh, histories of, of foreign policy. 
He was a vice president at MIT. He was a classic polymath engineer. He ran the Carnegie Institution for Science in Washington. And during World War II, he convinced Roosevelt to let him assemble a group of people that tried to bring to bear the strengths of technology uh, in warfare, whether it was dealing with the U-boats in an integrated system or proximity fuses or ultimately radar, which Britain was deeply involved with, or the atomic bomb. And so um, the reason I wanted to include that chapter was, as you mentioned, Brian, I, I think that science and technology issues in diplomacy will become increasingly important. Um, I believe it was important with the United States success at the end of the Cold War, which I was part of. I think it'll be a question with China. But also, if you think about issues like climate change and biological security and data issues, these will require a fusion of some of the approaches one took through traditional diplomacy with science and technology. And I had the good fortune, I, was, I led the US effort in the 92 Framework Accord for climate change, which is the basis for the Paris Accord and others. Now, one of the ideas that Vannevar Bush had uh, was described as the triple helix. And this came out of a report he issued in 1945 called Science, the Endless Frontier. And to, to simplify it, basically, he was, he was trying to come up with a way in which free societies can encourage maverick thinkers, independent minds, but also contribute to the larger challenges of the society and security. Centralized control systems often aren't so good for free thinkers, <laughs> and so as the case in the Soviet Union. And we'll see how that works for China, and because you can see even in past years, some of the clampdown on the private sector in China and some of the innovative minds. So um, the idea of the triple helix was that it's important for government support basic research, involve universities, but then also the private sector to, to develop it. Um, I, as for kind of innovation in societies, I think you know, this has been one of the strengths of the United States. It, it's not only the software development, but if you think about the geopolitics of energy, the whole shale revolution over the past decade is a wonderful example of actually taking existing technology with innovation, views of property rights, venture capital, and transforming uh, markets. Um, you know, this is the year of the pandemic, but it's also the year of SpaceX. You got private, you know, Elon Musk's sort of efforts to bring the private sector to space. And as you mentioned, you know, vaccine development, uh, which has been incredibly rapid uh, given, given historical times. I guess my suspicion is, uh, while this is an advantage of the US system, it can't take it for granted. And so this will focus on R&D, uh, openness for immigration. So I think that Trump's approach of closing US universities off or making it harder to bring talented people is exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, venture capital firms, which create a real strength in this. And this idea that it, you, there's always a tension in the security world about keeping a place for people of independent minds. And, uh, but they're, they're the heart of innovation. As for the relation with China, um, I suspect, and, and Henry Kissinger's made the same point, that really neither the China nor the United States will sort of accept dominance by the other party. I just don't think it's practical. And the nature of technology is one gets an advantage, but the other sort of develops from it. So I think you're gonna see a combination of competition um, and, and cooperation. And this will again be one of the challenges for the new administration. And I think you'll see that the Biden people will try to develop this in concert with, with allies and partners. I would not be surprised to see an early effort to bring democracies together on technology issues. So um, I'm gonna move on to um, some possible criticisms of the book and you're, you're free to disagree with me on this, but I was surprised um, considering you served as the World Bank president between um, 2007 and 2012 throughout the financial crisis that it didn't really get much of a mention in the book. And um, Hank Paulson, Henry Paulson, who, who does a review on the back of the book, um, if you've read Adam Tooze's Crashed, uh, you know that he described the, the moment as economic 9-11. And Ben Bernanke described uh, the moment as the, the worst financial crisis in history, I believe. Um, 
How detrimental was the, the financial crisis, do you think, for America's place in the world? Well, I'm glad you asked the question because, you know, one of the challenges as an author is you have to define how far you're going to go. So um, the reason I didn't deal with the financial crisis directly was uh, the last chapter really ends with President Bush 41. So it ends in 1992. And, and I did that for a conscious reason. My, my own sense of, of historiography is it sometimes takes time for history to settle. Uh, the first drafts often reflect um, sort of uh, the political partisanship of the era. This is a very partisan period uh, in the United States and other countries. Because I've served in, in these administrations, I actually wanted to be careful because either I would be accused of, of attacking somebody for partisan reasons or perhaps, you know, not paying enough attention to the mistakes of a Republican administration. And I was worried that would dwarf the attention to the 200 years that, that we covered. I did uh, arrive at a somewhat of a compromise, and that was because um, I had a seminar at Harvard of faculty and graduate students, and they said, you can't stop in 1992. So you'll see, I devised something that um, Richard Neustadt used for presidential power, and that is he used an afterword. And so I used the afterword to look at the following four presidencies, and I examined them in the context of five tradition. And this is a plea to publishers, because if you look at Richard Neustadt's volumes, he kept doing new editions with new afterwards. So uh, <laughs> I'm hoping to have a follow-up process. But as for the substance of your question, there's no doubt that the global financial crisis was a blow to sort of U.S. power uh, and imagery. But it, it, I think it's salutary to think that a lot depends on, on how countries respond to, to crisis. So, I mean, consider this. You know, the U.S. dollar actually in the financial crisis and afterwards actually became stronger as a reserve currency. Um, the problems of the Eurozone in 2011, 12, 13, in a sense, um, slowed down what you might have uh, uh, sort of imagined sort of the Euro as a competitor. Fortunately, the U.S. Uh, recapitalized its banking system more quickly than other countries did, came out of it stronger. And I saw this in relations with China, because as you suggested, the first reaction of the Chinese was, oh, this is the fall of Western capitalism. But a lot of them then watched the United States prove its resiliency and actually say, well, there's something here that we don't, that, that doesn't quite compute in our, in our system. I do think, however, your point's important in explaining the US politics and role in the world. But here, I would expand beyond the financial crisis. I think we're still living in the shadow of 9-11 and the long wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Then there's the, the global financial crisis, and now we have COVID-19. So uh, I think th this is where uh, it, it's hard to be a predictor, but I think historians will look back on those disruptive events and see how countries adapted. You know, uh, who's to say for sure? My own sense is the US, like other countries, makes mistakes. Um, it has more resilience than people often recognize. I mean, even in my career, I've, you know, it's ironic you, you mentioned, there, there is a, a book that came out in 1988 about the rise and fall of great powers, talking about how the US was gonna be slipping behind. This was right after, <laughs> at the end of the Cold War when it worked out the other way. But you'll, you may know that at the end of my book, I have a quote from Tocqueville, which kind of summarizes your point, which is that, that not that the United States is more enlightened than any other country, its strength is in its ability to repair its faults. So we'll see. Uh, and that's why I continue to write op-ed pieces and others to try to nudge it in the right direction. So uh, one, of the, one of the slogan that's, uh, that, that, that's dominated the last four years is America first, which is um, the phrase used in the inauguration speech in 2017. Um, we learned from the book that America first isn't, it doesn't begin with Donald Trump. Um, Woodrow Wilson uses the phrase as well. Um, so if you were to give an assessment of the, the, the Trump presidency and its place in history, um, how, how new is it? How, how new is his approach to foreign policy? Do you think it's particularly unique? Well, you know, I'm, I have to watch my biases on this because I've been quite negative to <laughs> the Trump years. Um, the U.S. has had some very bad presidents before. Um, 
I think this time the effects are more widespread because the United States, as, as you and I discussed, was certainly a global power at a time of flux. And here, um, I think that the Trump approach was particularly destructive. Um, it, it, to help people understand it, you know, keep in mind, Trump uh, in his, w was a disruptive politician. He wanted to come in as somebody who was sort of challenging the traditional order. And so you can look at a number of his foreign policies as derivatives of his political coalition. So for example, he was anti-immigration and this led him to focus on the wall of Mexico. So even when Congress wouldn't fund it, some people were shocked that he'd take money out of the Defense Department accounts. In some ways, given his politics, he had to. He couldn't be seen as giving up on that issue. I mean, um, it, it's, it's in some ways, if I would draw an analogy today, you know, Boris Johnson won his election, his most recent election by emphasizing, you know, get it done with Brexit, right? So he, he couldn't abandon that given his politics. Similarly, uh, Trump's trade protectionism was a function of kind of his economic message. And politicians, whether good or bad, need to maintain their authenticity with, with their political base. And you can see how strong Trump's hold is over his base. Another part of it was uh, that he was going to be different from his predecessors. So you'll notice he, if Obama did an agreement with Iran, he had to walk away from it. Uh, but whether it was Obama or the Republicans who didn't deal directly with North Korea, he would deal directly with North Korea. I think the, one of the greatest parts was that he had a very transactional style. And a transactional style meant that he really saw no value to institutions and alliances. And you know, the story of my book uh, from 1947, 49 on is in part how the United States develops these regimes and institutions and alliances and leverage them as part of its, its power abroad. So the chapter on Bush 41 is titled Alliance Leader because he was particularly skilled at doing this with the end of the Cold War in Europe or the Gulf War Coalition. Um, there's another piece that uh, my own personal assessment is, I've had the good fortune to work with a number of presidents of both parties. While presidents have to have strong egos, all of them that I met still saw the country as being larger than themselves. And I think with Trump, you can see his narcissism kind of means it's all about him, you know, even to the point where he's sort of denying the outcome of the election. So to bring it back to the politics, however, um, there's a resiliency in the system. He got voted out. We'll see uh, whether he has ongoing effect. Um, it'll be a question about his long-term effect on the Republican Party, and I believe two-party competition is, is important. And the alliance and security order, I think one could make a number of repairs because frankly, if you think about Japan, Korea, or Australia, could they really manage their security on their own or even Europe? I mean, the French forces in, in, North, in Africa today rely heavily on US logistics and intelligence. So there, there will be some reckoning uh, and I think some of this could be good. I think Europe taking on more responsibility for its own security could be a good idea. Um, but I think if the United States demonstrates its ability to be a respectful and cooperative partner again, uh, you can remedy some of this. I think the economic system is more fragile. And, and I think this will be a challenge because Biden has protectionist constituencies in his own party. And if I were, I, I wrote a piece actually uh, in the Wall Street Journal last week where I was focusing on data as an issue where you're going to need to have new frameworks in addition to trade. So I, I would watch the economic space, as well as the transnational topics we talked about, climate, biological security. So I'd, I'd like to ask you more about the, the legacy of the Trump presidency. Um, he's, he's often seen as a president and often quite rightly as, uh, as one who's anti-multilateralism and internationalism. Um, the number of uh, things that he's withdrawn from over the, over the last four years, uh, is, is an endless list almost so the the paris climate agreement and the uh, the nuclear deal with iran um how lasting will the damage uh, inflicted on u.s power be do you think do you think biden can resurrect some of the some of the status that the united states had before i think it it of course you can remedy some of this 
by, for example, rejoining the WHO or rejoining the Paris Accord on Climate. But I don't think that's quite enough because, you know, one of the facts I've observed over my life is multilateralism has to serve a purpose. So I've been part of trade, I've been part of the World Bank and international economic institutions. It's not just that people meet to discuss things, it's what they do. And so the challenge here will be uh, with the vaccine distribution and whether we can have a sound international economic recovery and whether we can help some of the developing countries with, with their debt. As I, as I mentioned, um, you know, there's a debate in Europe about the reliability of the United States. Obviously, I, it's sad to see that, but I could see it being, being constructive too. I think if Europe has to develop its own strategic sense, as a group of democracies, I think it will remain the closest partner for the United States. But I think that uh, uh, when, when they each bring their own perspectives to the table, you probably end up with a better solution. Uh, since since uh, I'm speaking to you in Britain, I think one of the issues will be, you know, where does Great Britain fit in this system, which I have a strong interest in because I think Britain uh, can play a role on security, economic, sort of climate, other issues. Or, you know, it can become an international player or it can slip into being Little England. And so that's a big challenge for, for Britain going forward. So I think, you know, these will be the challenges of a Biden administration. At the same time, they've got a lot of priorities at home to deal with. In the case of China, I think the effects will be more long lasting because I think uh, the, the Chinese were surprised by the degree of uh, separation. And I think the combination of the, the decoupling from the United States and the COVID have led um, Xi Jinping to take an approach that he's talked about dual circulation. And it, there's an old theme in Chinese history about self-sufficiency. Um, but at the same time, you know, you can see they want to have international engagement. And this brings us back to this complex issue about whether they will be able to have the engagement that will help them with international economic growth while being perceived as a security threat uh, to, to others. So again, to give you a little historical perspective on this, you know, when Xi Jinping took office in 2012, he developed a documentary film about the end of the Soviet Union and he ordered all the party cadres to see it. Now, if that film had been developed in Europe, Gorbachev would have been the hero that helped end the Cold War. The Chinese version is a little different. Gorbachev was the fool that abandoned the Communist Party, broke up his country and led to ruin. And it was a not so subtle message, which is it's not gonna happen here. So, you know, for many Europeans, uh, the end of the Cold War is a historical event. It, it casts a long shadow over Chinese Communist Party politics. We need to sort of keep that in mind. Um, I think, as I have alluded to, you know, in my experience and my reading of history, the United States is most effective when it works with others to leverage its power. Um, you know, I saw this with Bush and Baker in the Gulf, first Gulf War coalition. I saw it with our alliance politics at the end of the Cold War. I saw it, you know, with, with Reagan and the dual track issues with, with sort of arms control. Um, it's not so easy because it's easier to stake out your own position, but frankly, it's more effective diplomacy. And there's another part of the US that you'd be better able to judge, but I'm always fascinated how for all the United States' sort of uh, turmoil or frictions, there's a cultural draw. I mean, I, I've watched, for example, how the Me Too movement in the United States has spread globally. I mean, to countries you wouldn't expect it in. It's kind of, a, it's even, you see it in Chinese politics now. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement have had that. So, um, you know, the United States is, can both be attractive and repelling to people. And, and that's, uh, uh, but on the other hand, you know, one of the tests is, do people want to come here? And the answer is yes, if we deal with COVID. I guess the last point I'd make is, and this again shares my diplomatic experience, Ryan, it's important um, to recognize that moments of disruption also create opportunity. So remember, you know, I was a relatively young undersecretary in 1989. Um, some people were frozen by events, you know, fortunately we, started to anticipate and we move with them on the way to German unification. So 
since I spend my time also in the business and economic world, I would just say, I think coming out of COVID, you're going to see the acceleration of some recent trends, particularly in the digital world. Um, and uh, so it's important, whether you're countries or companies, to try to think about how you can reshape the landscape. And, and that'll be a challenge for the U.S. as well as Britain and the European Union and others. So I'm, I'm conscious of your time, so I'll, I'll finish with this one, and it's on climate change, which is probably going to be the issue that will dominate politics for the next 50 to 100 years, I suppose. Um, now, on uh, the 22nd of September of this year, uh, Xi Jinping um, announced that China was going to aim to become carbon neutral by 2060. Um, and we've seen under the Trump presidency a well, they've gone backwards on, on climate politics and, and cl climate change um, initiatives. Uh, do you see China as a potential leader on climate change matters? I hope it will be. Uh, the challenge, of course, will be for China to transform its distant pledges into quicker action. Uh, you know, China is still building coal-fired electricity plants, which uh, you know, are a major problem in the system. Um, on the other hand, China has invested a lot in new technologies uh, and it see that as to its advantage, including in, in batteries and, and sort of electric vehicles. So this is a good example of where, because the U.S. detached from that system, we weren't in a very good position to push China to act. It's a, also a good example of diplomacy in that, you know, China is doing this not only uh, as sort of a, uh, a global responsible player, but because if the Himalayas melt, it's going to be a very bad sort of response uh, in China. So it's a question of self-interest. Um, people who know this field better suggest that there's a lots of win-win opportunities here. There's technology innovation in the US and Europe, but to really bring this to scale, you'd probably want to be able to do it in the Chinese market. Frankly, it's not only China. I mean, another big player in this is going to be India. And India is frankly lagging behind sort of China's commitments. But I, the bigger issue here that I, I'll share with you, given kind of your interests, is it, it's a challenge of how the US and others will integrate climate with its larger foreign and economic policies. So, um, you know, uh, President elect Biden has selected John Kerry as his lead person on this. On the one hand, that's encouraging. Kerry's a you know, former Secretary of State. He's more of a peer to, to Biden. He's an experienced person. He's an activist. On the other hand, I hope that the United States integrates its climate policy with its foreign policy, because this is also should be a basis for strengthening our relations with Europe and Britain and our allies. Frankly, since uh, uh, Boris Johnson and Britain will host the next COP in Glasgow, this could be a wonderful opportunity to kind of help Britain on the global stage, help interact with Britain uh, post-Brexit. And then similarly, as you mentioned, it'll be an important part of your policies with China. Now, it's also an important part of, of, of development issues uh, because, you know, there's probably about 10 or 12 major economies that make up about 80 to 85 percent of the, 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 uh, the, the greenhouse gases. But if you're an island state, well, you've got an awful interest in adaptation. Um, when I was at the World Bank, I tried to get a focus on how soil carbon in Sub-Saharan Africa could help absorb carbon significantly, but also help African agriculture. And you got a win-win venture in there. You see this in avoided deforestation or forestation issues. You're gonna see this in technology transfer issues. So I think part of the challenge will be to make climate policy part fit within kind of your larger diplomatic aims to pull together a coalition. And the reason I'm stressing this point is it, it goes back to that chapter I alluded to with Van Ever Bush, is that sometimes uh, a field like biological security or climate is kind of managed by the technology specialists. You want them to be part of it, but frankly, you also need the diplomacy to kind of uh, sort of bring people around. I'll give you a very practical example. After the breakdown of the climate discussions in Copenhagen, I was at the World Bank and I invited the uh, head of the UNFCCC uh, 
of Christina Figueres to come see me at the World Bank. And I said, so the, Mexico is going to be hosting the next uh, set of climate meeting, the next COP. And I said, so, you know, what's your plan to overcome this? And she said, well, we need to get 190 countries to agree to a big long list of things. And I said, well, what's the chance you're going to do that? And she said, oh, very small. And I said, well, what's plan B? And she said, oh, there can't be plan B. And I said, well, that doesn't make sense to me. So I, I went to see President Calderon of Mexico because I knew he was interested in climate. And I said, Mr. President, you know, you probably think that this is, uh, you're just the host and the UN will manage all the substance. I said, it won't work that way. If it breaks down, it's all going to be on your shoulders. And I brought with him a series of two pagers on about oh, 12 or 15 topics. And I said, the first thing you need to do is get your own government organized. So you need, whether it's foreign ministry, energy, environment, finance, you need to get them all working in the same direction. I said, but if you go back and you look at the 92 framework accord, you'll see that the way climate policy works internationally is countries send, make their own individual national action plans. They're political commitments, not legal commitments. But in some ways that's good because countries can try to stretch. And I said, but there's nothing that would prevent 150 of the 190 to agree on common policies on soil carbon or 170 to agree on avoided deforestation or others. And I said, you could take this approach as building blocks. And the more you get people pulling together, I said, the better chance you're gonna be able to put together an umbrella arrangement. And that's exactly what he did. And this was the approach, by the way, that led to the Paris Accord. And a week before the event, I went to see him again. And I said, you know, Mr. President, you're doing a great job. You're pulling things together. I said, but be careful because with success, you'll find that somebody will decide they wanna hold up the process. And I said, my guess is it'll probably be Bolivia and I said, get your lawyers to look at the meaning of consensus, as you probably think it means everybody. But international law is a little strange on this. It doesn't necessarily mean everybody. And so he did that. And sure enough, the Bolivians tried to hold up the whole deal. And he managed to have a consensus without the Bolivians. And because of that, I guess I was awarded the Aztec Eagle. So I'm the Mexican honorary uh, sort of recipient. But my point with the story is it's a classic of how I was trying to combine diplomacy, putting together coalitions, combination of interest and leverage with the science and the technology. And that will be a lot of the challenge going forward. And I, I could apply a similar analogy to biological security, because as you may know, the world's leading virologists, you know, say what we've encountered here with COVID, you know, you, there's about five viruses a year that sort of could be like a COVID-19. And we're going to, you can see we're getting increasing frequency and economic costs. And it's a direct function of the overlap between wildlife, agriculture, and humans, particularly in the Asia context here. And uh, there's about, as I think maybe about 800,000 viruses that affect birds or, or mammals that could have zoonotic potential. And for $1.2 billion, we could know the the sequence for about 70 to 80% of them. That strikes me as a pretty good investment to make. But what I'm trying to talk about here is that for your generation, as you think about foreign policy, you won't be able to ignore the traditional ones like powerful states and nuclear weapons and regional hegemons. But the question of how you uh, sort of deal with these scientific technological topics, but also within a diplomatic framework, and this of course includes economics, will I think be one of the most significant challenges that you face. Okay, Bob Zalek, thanks for your time. It was good to be with you. Thank you. Thanks very much.